Hi folks, it's Andy. Welcome to Kendo Rant. Okay, we have loads of fantastic questions for you today. We'll jump to them in just a second. But first, don't forget, like, share, subscribe. You know, all the YouTube stuff. Most importantly, support the channel by shopping at kendostar.com. That's my website, of course, that sells amazing, fantastic, brilliant, awesome, stupendous kendo equipment. <laughs> so get to kendostar.com, all right? Get, get your gear from there uh, and you won't regret it. Okay, right, let's get on to these questions. I have a question. Many sensei say to strike with the hips. How should this be understood? So what it means is I don't use that terminology that much because I do think it's a little bit uh, confusing. What it really means is to keep your uh, posture straight as possible, keep your body square uh, to your opponent and then push from your left leg so that you drive from your lower body as you uh, make a strike forward and do fumikomi. Um, what it means is not to sort of turn as you make the strike, which lots of people uh, do, uh, it means uh, to make sure that you're sort of driving forward um, and your, your hips move forward in a sort of uh, square direction, <laughs> if you know what I mean uh, by square. I mean like straight onto your opponent. Okay, uh, that's basically what it means. Uh, hi Andy, I started Kendo last month after watching your videos. Oh great, fantastic. Um, it's awesome, uh, and you've helped me a great deal. Oh, good, that's wonderful to know. Um, Adojo has uh, third, fourth, and seventh dan sensei, so I'm quite lucky. Yes, you are indeed. However, however, I'm worried that I'm too old to start at the age of 34. Do you think it's an acceptable age, and will I get the chance to achieve anything, Kendall? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, uh, one, one of the most um, sort of influential senseis I know started Kendo in his 30s, and he's now uh, uh, Kyoshi seventh dan. Um, it's it's definitely not too late. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. So um, do your best at it. Uh, there's still plenty of time to achieve plenty. Uh, so don't, um, you know, don't write yourself off. <laughs> okay. Um, do your best. I'm supporting you. Next one, I have a couple of questions about the use of Hante to decide the outcome of Shi'ai. Uh, firstly, the rules state the decision is first made by judgment of skill, then attitude. Uh, I'm not sure they do. Uh, when things do, uh, what things do you look for when making Hante? Secondly, when I first started Shi'ai, it was in Korea and Q grades Shi'ai were decided by hen Hante instead of uh, Encho. Uh, I was told that this was to encourage the right kind of Kendo. Uh, i.e. not blocking and being defensive. I also imagine it helped a lot with keeping the running of the time of the Shi'ai down. From your experience in Japan, do they use Hante much? Uh, and do you think it should be used more? Uh, let me grab the rule book. Oof, okay, here we are. So, uh, here's the rule book. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> Kendo Star branded. Um, <laughs> uh, right. Um, so, the rules on Hante are in, I think it's Article 9. Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's on page 4 if you've got uh, this this book um so here's the thing right here's where this is this is a bit confusing uh and i, I think they've um they've they've sort of the translations caused a bit of confusion here because uh it says that hante prescribed in article 7 item 5 of the regulations should be based on the following criteria uh in the case uh, in case a shiaisha has made datotsu nearly equal to you called datotsu or his or her skills uh, sorry his or her skills should be regarded as superior and to in case shiaisha is predominant in posture and movements his or her ha attitude should be regarded as superior now the thing is is this word attitude here is easily to be misunderstood it doesn't use the word attitude in the japanese side it doesn't say that at all it says that uh, in the japanese side it's just say that uh, number one uh, the the player that has made the strikes that's close to you called that hot valid strike and number two it says that the shiaisha, uh, the shiaisha with the better posture and movements uh, it doesn't use the word attitude or an equivalent word for attitude in the Japanese so it's nothing to do with attitude um, basically what it means is one you vote for the person who you think uh, made strikes that were almost good enough to be valid but weren't uh, quite there 
And two, if uh, if there isn't that, then you vote for the one who's uh, basically got better posture and movement. So otherwise, to put it simply, the one who's better, the one who you think is better at Kendall um, in terms of skill. It, it, it doesn't actually say attitude. Uh, so <clears throat> that's that's how you're supposed to make the judgment, okay? Um, you, you, you're not supposed to make the w- judgment based on the one who who you think is, I don't know, more polite or something. Um, so, yeah. Uh, then, uh, in terms of your second part, uh, in Korea, all the Q grades were decided by Hante instead of Encho, Encho, uh and that's to encourage the right kind of Kendo, not blocking and being defensive. Uh, and it, you imagine it helped with keeping the time of the Shi'ai down. Uh, in Japan, do they use Hante much? And do I think it should be used more? No, they don't use Hante much in Japan. Uh, sometimes they use it for kids Shi'ai if there's a lot of them. Um, it's pretty rare. Most kids Shi'ai are actually decided within the time limit. Limit. Uh, it's very rare that it'd have to go to Hante. Hante. Um, I, uh, they do use it sometimes, of course, um, but it's not it's not common. I don't like the idea of making all Q grades do it um, or all kids have to do Hante um, at all. Uh, actually, I think that discourages them from um, developing a proper understanding of what's a valid strike. Um, a you call dot two, so I, I don't like that idea actually. Um, and no, I don't think it should be used more. I think it should be used uh, in cases where it's pretty unavoidable. In the past, it was used a lot more. They even used it in the All Japan Championships in in the in the past. Um, but I don't um, I don't like it as a system for determining the score overall. Uh, to be honest, uh, I think. As much as possible, uh, the, the result of the Shi'ai should be determined by the players uh, rather than the referees. <clears throat> uh, next question. Uh, Hi, Andy. I have some questions about writing your name on a Shi'ai. I know that it's supposed to go on the left side of the scar, but uh, that's the only thing I could really find information on. And the fact that I've seen some people put Japanese kanji on them wanted to know when it's appropriate to do so and the exact meaning behind it or as I wasn't able to find much information on this. So I figured I would ask ask you, since you're so amazing about answering all of our questions, <laughs> which we all really appreciate. And thank you for the Kendo community. It wouldn't be the same without you. Have a fantastic day. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've never heard you have to write it on the left side of the sky. I write it on both sides. Uh, I usually write it in Japanese on one side and English on the other. It's quite faded, this one. Uh, but I, I usually write it on, on, on both sides. Um... So, yeah, um, I've never written anything other than just my name, though. Uh, and I haven't really seen many people write anything other than the name. Uh, I guess some people might write a sort of, I don't know, slogan or something to try and motivate them. I don't know. Uh, but for the most part, I, I think you're better off just sticking to your name. Um, it, it, it's, it's there for, uh, you know, it's just, it's just to identify the Shania as yours. Um, I wouldn't get too into sort of writing something super special on uh the scar for the time being okay but i think you can write it on either side uh hi andy i went to a national tournament a while ago and faced someone doing nito uh i did quite badly because i'd hardly ever practiced against a nito user uh what advice do you have for someone who hardly gets to practice versus uh nito when f- facing them uh, it's difficult isn't it because yeah most of us don't have the um uh experience in practicing against nito uh and one of the best tactics at the minute is often not really allowed because it's like Hikiwaza from Super Zeri Ai. Uh, so, you know, these sort of temporary um, pandemic rules can actually uh, unfairly advantage, uh, I think, um, Jordan and Nito players, actually, uh, to some extent, uh, because I think that a good ta- well, one of the best tactics against those, uh, both of those types of players, especially Nito, is... Um, is Hikiwaza from Super Zeri Ai. Uh, just my thoughts. Uh, however, um, the thing is, the way to deal with uh, Nito uh, is generally, um, I 
tend not to... I try to avoid interacting with their short door, the short sword. Most Nito players rely on the short door to create their openings to attack. And if you if you uh, take the Shinai away from that and avoid it... So instead of standing in my normal Chudan like this, I'll, I'll, I'll bring my Shinai to like... A little bit like in the Nihon Kendo Kata number 5, where you point towards the Kote. But I bring it further back, so they've got no chance of even touching... Touching my Shinai with their Shoto, uh, and my Kote is well guarded, and my men's easily defended as well. Um, I could do it either way. Sometimes I'll switch from both sides this way, depends on what side their Daito is on. But I, I just won't even re interact with their Shoto as much as possible because they, they usually rely on that to try and create their openings. Uh, and then otherwise, um, try not to become too defensive uh, because what they'll try to do is try to create. A point where you're just blocking and then they'll try and hit you. Uh, if they're any good, they might be able to hit uh, katate kote. Uh, most of them can't, but you know many many of them can. So um, you have to be careful of too much blocking. Uh, and yeah, um, otherwise it's just going to be practice. <laughs> you could do like the men, you know, the strike, the tayatari, and then hikiwaza quickly after that as well. Um, their, their door is usually quite undefended, uh, but if you like do the uh, strike, tayatari hiki door, and they uh, they drop their hands to block the door, then next time do the same thing, do the attack, tayatari show the door, and then do men like katsugi men this way. That might work. So depends on the player, of course. So there's a few different things you can do. Uh, next one, when making, uh, when doing men kaishi do, how do you uh, gauge the distance for making a block and a valid door strike? Uh, I'm new to kendo and I can't seem to grasp the regular distance for kaishi waza. I can't make the valid strike after blocking the men strike. Uh, it's like I'm too late uh, and the opponent gets close to me too fast. Uh, any advice? Yeah, uh, so there's two things uh, that people mainly uh, struggle with men kaishi do with. First is that they're... Um, their uh, strike isn't done in the Ichibyoshi rhythm. So they'll block and then hit. So one, two, this way, one, two, this way. When that, that you don't have time for that. It has to be pa -pam, this way, pa -pam, pa -pam. just in one movement, pa -pam, like that. Uh, and uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, so you need to make sure you're nice and relaxed so that you can quickly pa -pam, turn the shinai back. Yeah. Uh, you have to say papa when you're doing it as well. No, you don't. You have to say door. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so quickly, this way. Uh, and then secondly is um, your posture. Uh, most people really struggle with men kaiju door because what they do is they'll they'll lean this way as they try to try to hit the door. They'll they'll lean like this, lean this way um, when they try to hit the door strike. The problem is is what you do is you're leaning towards your opponent. So what you're actually doing is you're actually closing the distance. Even more so, <laughs> yeah. So you're actually removing the distance that you do have to play with by leaning forward. Okay, so you have to keep your posture pam, pam, this way. Okay, uh, as you make the strike, you don't want to lean this way. It doesn't matter what you've seen Japanese kids do on YouTube. Yeah, uh, most of the good ones don't do that either. So um, you know, don't try to duck like this. This way, okay. Um, and then lots and 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 lots of practice. <laughs> uh, next one are there greater and lesser ippons are some ippons subject subjectively valued more than others in the world of kendo is a men ippon considered greater than a kote uh, is it considered better to score men from a long distance versus shorter distance block than men hope this question makes sense yeah it makes sense it's a common question um, there shouldn't be no there's nowhere in here that says that you should value <laughs> it's picking up on my green screen but um there's no one in here, nowhere in the rules that say you should value one ippon over the others. Uh, not at all. There is such a thing as what's called genmyo nawaza. Genmyo nawaza is uh, techniques that are particularly difficult or, um, you know, uh, require a very high level of skill. Um, and they are techniques where the referees are encouraged to give more leeway, should we say, uh, on the criteria of Yuko Dototsu as to whether to consider them valid or not, given the fact that they are so difficult. But, um, no, uh, the, the, um, it, it's not the case that you could say men is better than Kote, and it's, it's, it's wrong to think of it that way, it doesn't say that anywhere. Uh, obviously, everybody has their own individual preferences to techniques, but as a referee, you shouldn't be considering, um, men better than Kote, uh, 
for the most part. Uh, okay. Uh, it just depends on the um, situation. Yeah. Sometimes it looks that way because, you know, one person will attack men and the other will try and do the man of and they give the men. Um, and, you know, that's often misinterpreted as well. Men's better strike. That's why it's not that. It's that the, the person hitting men took the sen, the initiative, before they struck. It's, it's more to do with the quality of the strikes themselves. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> next one. Uh, hey, Andy, I was recently having a hard time learning how to do had I had it, Makiwaza. Uh, currently just focusing on Maki, but wondering if you had any tips or advice that would help learn this without, with or without a partner. Also, would like to know why we use this waza or what kind of situation to use it. Uh, thank you again for the amazing videos. Love watching and learning from. So, for me, Hadai and Hadi uh, are basically the same thing. I know there's books that say they're not, uh, but the Zen Ken then doesn't make a difference between them. Um, so, for me, I think they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, the uh, Makiwaza, <laughs> don't worry about Makiwaza. Don't worry about Makiwaza. It's a super overrated waza that's, you know. Um, just don't worry about it. Uh, the, the the way to get better harai and that sort of waza is to increase your wrist flexibility. So you can do the saburi where you uh, twist twist your wrists um, like uh, this way. I haven't got much space, that's why I'm... This sort of saburi. Yeah, I've done it in a couple of the saburi videos I've done. Uh, that'll definitely help you increase your wrist flexibility. And that's where your sort of harai waza comes from. Um, as well as your kaishi waza and the maki waza actually, but don't worry about maki waza. It's not an important waza at all. Um, to be honest, it's a super periphery waza. Um, you know, uh, the time, the situation depends on, it depends on the opponent, the situation you use those sort of techniques. Uh, harai is quite useful against, it can be useful against someone who has a very stiff kamae, also, a very loose kamae depends. You can, if you, if they've got very stiff kamae, you can do the strong harai uh, on uh, their kote side, uh, and they might readjust, overcompensate when they readjust to come back from your harai, uh, and have a route to the men. If they've got very loose kamae, then you can make a very strong strike, and it will create an opening as well so it depends you have to kind of watch uh your opponent and see I've, i'm not gonna lie these sort of thing these techniques i don't use them that much i don't find them super useful my personally um sometimes harai gote is is okay but I, I don't use them a lot so i don't think they're super useful hi andy my burger has some loose stitches what do you recommend to do leave them like that cut the loose thread uh maybe there's a way to restitch um so look the best thing to do is uh yeah, just cut off the excess. Um, you don't need to worry about a massive deal. It won't make a huge difference. I wouldn't try and start stitching them back. What you can do, you've got to be really careful. I'm not sure I should really recommend this. It's, I'm not recommending this. But what I have seen some people do, and I'm not recommending you do this. Um, and I'm not going to state as to whether I've done it before myself. Uh, but you can, you can cut the threads and then you can get like a lighter, like a naked flame lighter. Um, and you can quickly brush that against the, the edge. Uh, of the of the the cut thread, uh, and the thread itself will probably melt a little bit, uh, and it'll stop it. All right, but like literally just a, a little brush against it, a quick second. Don't burn yourself. I didn't tell you to do it. I'm not recommending you do it. Um, it's just something I've seen other people do. All right. Uh, next one. How important is a second dojo? <laughs> so a second dojo is usually like the place you go to after practice, like for a drink, right? Like a bar or a pub or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's important, isn't it? Um, for the culture of your dojo. Uh, obviously not all dojos have it. My, my, my dojo doesn't have it. We don't have that. It's not a practical thing for us. Um, mainly because, uh, we might, you know, I, we go to our dojo as a family with my, my, my wife comes and my children come. So it's not really appropriate for us to go to sort of drinking afterwards. <laughs> um, but we do do other things instead, like social events, like a, we had a Christmas party the day where our whole dojo went bowling together, for example. So, um, you know, it might not necessarily be the second dojo directly after practice, but those sort of social gathering, social events, as a dojo, yeah, they're super important, I think. I think that sort of social uh, aspect um, to create a positive dojo culture is is super, super important. So I definitely recommend it, even if you can't do it every time after practice like we can't. 
Uh, hi Andy, what's a good way to train that explosive push with the left leg for strikes? I often widen my kamai, similar to how a sprinter pushes off starter blocks to f uh, for more force. But I know this is technically incorrect and also a huge tell for my opponent. How can we perform fast, powerful strikes straight from kamai standing straight up? Okay, so widening your kamai is not how you do it. <laughs> not how you do it at all. You will lose your explosive power from that absolutely will explode, uh, lose your explosive power from that. Look, you'll fix this with Sabiri, all right? You're doing Sabiri. Zenshin Kodai Men Sabiri. One forward, one back. That's how you'll fix it. And you've got to do loads of them. And you've got to really, really concentrate on pushing the right foot out with your left leg and immediately snapping the left leg back up. And then back. Bam. Push. Bam. Back, push, yeah? And you have to really concentrate that on every swing for hundreds and hundreds of swings. Uh, and then you will uh, start to develop the feeling that you need. You do not want to stand with a wider stance in your kamae. You will lose your explosive power. Uh, you will not make effective strikes doing that. What you are... Uh, what you will see instead with high level practitioners is they'll start from a reasonably narrow place and then they'll start to push out the right leg slowly. And it looks like they're getting wider, but actually it's not that they've got a wider stance. Their weight is almost entirely borne on their left leg. And then they're sort of pushing forward with their right leg for semi. And then instantly, bam, this way. All right, it's different to just standing with a wide stance. Okay, so don't do that. <laughs> Okay, uh, next one. Hello, Andy. Uh, when you see someone wearing borgu whilst not being in Seiza, is it appropriate to call the attention of the person, the stranger, doing it? Or just leave him on his own and let them or her discover? Uh, need your kind advice, thanks. So what you're talking about is when they're putting on the borgu, you're supposed to sit in Seiza when you put your door and tad it on. Uh, and your men and kote, of course. And if you see someone else that's not doing that, should you call them out? Uh, probably not. Um... Probably not. If you're not. If you're not like the dojo leader or the sensei or something like that, and it's just someone else in the dojo that's a stranger and that you don't really know, just leave. It's not your problem. All right. Don't don't involve yourself. You don't need to. Okay. Just let them. Let someone else will tell them um, when the time is right and that the the appropriate person to tell them will do so. So don't worry about that too much. Uh, I often see high-level sensei wear tabby. Uh, I feel like low-level people wear them as a crutch, but high-level claim that it is to, uh, to correct or improve their form. How does wearing tabby, I'm assuming uh, cloth bottom slippery kind, improve form, or perhaps it's just to keep the feet warm? Um, I, I, I don't think that tabby are popular amongst high-level senseis. I think there's literally... You could probably count them on one hand. Uh, the, the the ones certainly in Japan that wear them um, during kendo practice unless they've got a specific reason like an injury or something um, I don't think either that they do it to correct or improve their form because I cannot think how that works at all um, to be honest uh, it, it, it's probably more likely to keep the feet warm <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I, I, I do not think that wearing tabby is a a common thing it's certainly not in my experience uh amongst high level let's say eighth dan uh senseis uh and above um i've hardly ever seen it um actually not never seen it i've hardly ever seen it <laughs> okay uh that's it thank you for joining me today um some fantastic questions we really fired through them um Good question, so thank you for joining me. Uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Shop at Kendo Star. Keep the camera rolling. Keep the lights on. <laughs> I'll see you all next time. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.